thanks for inviting me to join you. Um, I'm not going to stand here and talk at you for the next hour. We're going to engage together and talk. Um, I think for this to be meaningful to you, I need to know, you know, what kind of questions you have. Um, let's let's have a, a dialogue this morning. I want to ask everybody. So, um, about what time do y'all get up in the morning? Seven thirty. Seven thirty. Nine thirty. Oh, I want your job. I got a job. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, seven thirty. About what? What? What do you do the first thing you get up in the morning? Uh, make the kids breakfast. Take them to school. And in order to make their breakfast, what do you have to do? Did you do this? <laughs> You're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody ever calls me to say, hey, the lights are on, my bill was right, uh, things are going good. People ask me what I do for Rocky Mountain Power, and I say, I wear the t-shirt with the bullseye on it. I am the company's face to the community. Um, from Salt Lake to Draper, Bluffdale, Harriman, Riverton, unincorporated Salt Lake County. There are four jurisdictions that I don't uh, have responsibility for. Taylorsville is one of them, uh, West Valley City, and West Jordan and South Jordan where I live. So I work with the mayors and city council members, the city engineers, planning commissions, um, just, you know, the, the whole gamut of city government. And if, if there are issues, I'm the one that they work through. They have me on speed dial, literally. And I have to tell you, I have, I think, an incredibly um, satisfying job. I, I think providing you all with electricity is important. What we do as a company drives our economy. It allows us to enjoy a very good standard of living. Um, you know, there was a time when women were out beating the clothes against the rocks in the, in the middle of the river, and now we drop them into a, into a washing machine. And, uh, and how about all these, you know, devices that we, we walk around with? I would defy you to um, find enough outlets in a home that was built even 25 years ago that would give you enough places to plug in everything that we consider to be a necessity today. We are becoming more and more dependent on electricity. Um, I'm very pleased to see the electric vehicle industry um, gaining momentum. Uh, that might be, um, you know, one of the keys to resolving our air quality issues here along the Wasatch Front. So, I love my job because uh, I look at it as being something bigger than, than me. Um, I help troubleshoot, solve problems, uh, make connections in the community. Um, I take a great deal of, of pleasure in being able to bring forward to my executive managers, ma management team proposals from nonprofit community-based organizations with Salt Lake Community College being, being one of them, uh, to help these organizations achieve their goals. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself um, that might explain my worldview and, uh, and, and the decisions that I have made. Uh, I grew up in, in Carbon County. Does anybody even know where Price, Utah is? Yes. Good. <laughs> so. Um, my grandparents, my, on my dad's side, uh, immigrated here. My grandmother was born in far northeast Italy. My grandfather, when he came here, was actually a subject of the King of Austria, according to his birth certificate. Today, that is part of, of Italy. So, on one side, I am first, or I'm second generation American. My mother's family, her, her grandparents, came here from, from Scotland. Um, my mother's mother, or my mother's father, excuse me, died when she was only five years old of strep throat. We didn't have penicillin at that time. So my grandmother was pregnant with my aunt. She raised two little girls and took care of her mother. She went back to school 
um, ended up, she was a teacher, she ended up getting her master's degree and ultimately became the elementary supervisor for all, all of Granite School District in, in Salt Lake City. Uh, on, my, on my father's side, my grandfather um, came up with the idea, he came here to mine coal. And back in those days, uh, they would do what is known as room and pillar mining. They had to leave, meaning they had to leave pillars of rock in place to hold up the overburden from what they had, had mined out. And mines, as you know, are notorious for methane gas, which is explosive. And in those days, they would hang treated burlap, thinking that was going to contain the methane gas, right? So he had this bright idea that what they should do is seal off these rooms with concrete block. So he and his buddy bought concrete block making equipment and on their days off they made blocks. They got the mine they were working at to adopt this policy. They'd just seal them off and then they'd, they'd move on and that became the accepted practice in the underground mining industry. When he went to the great beyond, my father uh, took over the, what was known as Etzel Concrete Products and uh, his primary customers were the mines in, in Carbon County. So I was telling Whitney that I, I reached a point in my college career where I needed to choose a major. I had completed all of my general ed requirements and it was time to get serious about what I was going to do and I had no idea what I wanted to do. And I remember this, this um, night in the living room with my dad and I'm like laying on the floor, oh, what am I going to do? What am I gonna... And um, he's suggesting, well, why don't you go into business? Well, my perception of what business was, was the business courses that had been offered in high school, which for girls at that time was typing and 10 key adding machines. <laughs> and, I, you know, that probably sounds so foreign to you, but that's what it was 40-something <laughs> years ago. I couldn't imagine that I would spend my life doing that. And it's odd that from a, a young age, there was something in me that I wanted to accomplish great things. I didn't know what those things might be, but I, I knew that I would leave my home. And... Um, when I left home to come to the, to the University of Utah. To me, it was very liberating in a way, but at that time, I almost considered Salt Lake to be the biggest small town I'd ever seen. I don't know what you might know about Carbon County, but um, There's nothing out there. <laughs> at the time I grew up, <laughs> it was a booming little community but it had, been, it had been settled primarily by immigrants who had come from other countries. They wanted a better life for themselves and their families. And, you know, it was like growing up in a microcosm, say, of, of a large city like New York. You had the Italians and the Greeks, my godfather's Greek, the, the Slavs, um, you know, and there's a joke that if somebody tells you a story about a, a Greek and Italian and a bohunk is what they called Eastern European and I don't mean that as any kind of slur so don't take it that way but in Carbon County that was not a joke that was just a story and the the work ethic that I grew up with was incredible I mean my dad as I said owned his own business he probably easily easily worked um, 14, 15 hours a day. And I grew up, I remember from being that high with you go to school, you get a degree, you get a good job, and don't think anybody's going to take care of you. And that was just the ethic that my friends and I all grew up with, was education is the key to a happy, successful life. And I don't necessarily mean that in material, in a material sense, if, you know, you're going to make a lot of money. Um, having an education opens your mind to possibilities. It opens your mind to 
um, being accepting of others' opinions that may differ from your own. And in a community where we had so many different ethnicities represented, we all, we were all the same. It, it just, it didn't matter. And, you know, we had the, the um, Italian days and the Greek festival and, the, and the, uh, the, the Poles put on the polka party at the Helper Auditorium. And we all grew up with, the, with an understanding and appreciation for one another's um, cultures and customs. And when I moved to Salt Lake, I didn't, I didn't find that. At least from my perception at the time, it was a white wonder bread. Everybody looked alike, thought alike, talked alike, ate, a, ate alike, and I thought in many ways Price, Utah had been more cosmopolitan than Salt Lake at the time. That has changed, thank goodness. So, I don't know, to tell you the truth, I don't know how I made the decision that I was going to major in journalism. But I can, I can tell you, without getting into politics, that um, I am proud of the profession that I chose. Because in today's political environment, I think it is essential that people have access to good news coverage that is objective. And I, I am pleased to see the resurgence, I think, of journalism as compared to communications. And I, I believe there, there is a difference. I chose journalism because I've always been able to write. I was the editor of the Price Junior Highlights. I guess that's what set me on this path. Um, as, as Whitney mentioned, I was the founding editor of a, a business newspaper that remains in, in publication today. Uh, my journalism training prepared me for the business career that I have had. Um, I guess I'm, I'm curious or nosy by nature. And journalists have license to ask questions. Uh, I, would, I would suggest to you that you should always recognize, no matter where you are in your career, that there are things that you don't know. You don't know what you don't know. But at 25, I'm, I'm sure I thought I was a lot smarter than I really was. And the older I get, the more I realize that I don't know what I don't know. Uh, I, I think that's, that's just our youthful exuberance. But I would, I would uh, suggest to you that you should ask questions. You might learn something. And um, learn to write. Good writing requires clear thinking. And you'll never write it clearly enough the first time. Good writing is hard work. I don't know if it was um, Mark Twain, I think it was, who once wrote, I apologize for the long letter. I didn't have time to make it short. Uh, I call editing verbal surgery. And there are I mean, if you study history, we, it's replete with examples of poor communication uh, trigger, triggering events that have affected people's lives. Pay attention to the words you use. They are, they are critically, critically important. And in business, um, it might translate into a huge uh, financial mistake if there has been misunderstanding. I always prefer personal communication. If I can't talk face to face, I'll walk down the hall, wave, if they're on the phone, I need to talk to you. Uh, if that's not gonna happen, let's, let's talk on the phone. I find email uh, to be expedient but not always effective. So 
I just caution you to uh, try to ensure that what is heard is what you meant. As you heard from, from Whitney, I've kind of had a varied career. I will confess to you that when I graduated from college, I had no idea what I was going to do. I thought maybe I would become a reporter for the Salt Lake Tribune. That didn't happen. And the guy who turned me down is now a member of Salt Lake Rotary with me. And I have, I have chided him but said, you know, you didn't give me that job. And I'm glad you didn't because I wouldn't have had the career I have today had you hired me. Who knows what would have happened. But um, I set upon a, a path to use the skills that I had developed um, or had, had, had uh, perfected, I guess, in, in college uh, in journalism. And being able to write clearly led to an opportunity to become press secretary to the governor of the state of Utah at a time when, when energy development was very important to this state. I grew up in Carbon County where coal uh, is, uh, has been the, the center of that economy for very long. I understood it. And I, 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 I marvel at the um, wonderful opportunities that came to me in, in the course of working for the governor of the state of Utah. He became uh, chair of the National Governors Association and I was so fortunate to be able to go with him to the, the Washington Post and meet with the editors there uh, for him to talk about what the, the governor's agenda was in 1982. From, for somebody growing up in Price, Utah, <laughs> who got a degree in journalism, that was a dream came, come true. I didn't think it would ever get any, any better than that. Um, after I left his office, I, I did go to work for this um, power wholesaler to the, the states, the, the, uh, the majority of the state's municipal utilities, and, but stayed in this role of uh, media relations, public relations, lobbying the state legislature, I reached a point where I wanted something else. And that was one of the scariest moments in my career, was a decision to reinvent myself. And I'm a little savant here in that I remember dates, and I was thinking this morning, it was 21 years ago today that was my last day at Utah Associated Municipal Power Systems and I was going to work for what was then Utah Power, today Rocky Mountain Power, in something I had never done before. And you've heard the phrase, fake it till you make it. Well, I'm here, I'm here to tell you I was faking it. Um, I did have the background in the industry, but I was walking in to, to manage our relationship with some of the state's biggest industrial and commercial customers, and I'd never done this before. But I understood the industry. I understood that you, you have to meet your, your customers' needs, and I would be the conduit to make that happen. I didn't know everything. Um, I didn't know all, all the time who I would go to in the company to resolve billing issues, reliability issues, uh, power quality issues, whatever it was. But I knew that I could go to someone who would know someone who would know someone and get this done. And just as an aside, I have to tell you, one of the, <clears throat> the most unusual experiences I had as an account manager was to research why Kimberly Clark's substation, 138,000 volt substation, kept tripping offline. They manufacture diapers up in, in Weber County. As it turns out, heron, the birds, heron were coming in, perching on the transmission Brian's. towers, and when they would take off, they leave a stream behind them that was crossing two phases of the, the conductors and causing a fault and taking the, the system down. So I had to go in and tell these guys that it was 
bird poop that was knocking them offline. An in, just an interesting little <laughs> experience. A couple years later, um, a, a, an employee uh, was taking an early retirement and the position was to move into what I'm doing now. Um, I thought it had my name on it with, with my background and experience. Uh, I have, I've never looked back, but I, gotta I took a two year, I'm gonna call it hiatus, uh, in 2001 when the governor's son, Jim Matheson, came to me and asked me to, to head up his, his state office here, uh, his congressional office. And uh, you're going to hear a lot here, if you haven't already, about redistricting. It, it happens at the national level, it happens at the state level, that every 10 years after the census, off, uh, districts for political office are redrawn because of the principle that we hold dear of one, one person, one vote. And in 2001, the congressional district for Jim Matheson was redrawn. It encompassed just a part of Salt Lake County, but it was redrawn to encompass two thirds of the land mass of the state of Utah in an effort to, to defeat him uh, because it was heavily, heavily Republican. And uh, we did win that race by 1,140 votes. I stepped back after that race and thought, I'm not at a place in my career where I can put my financial security on the, on the line every two years. I had one son in college, one who would be coming up, and I was fortunate that an opportunity arose at Rocky Mountain Power for me to return, and I did so in a different role, but within about three or four years was able to return to the job that I'm in. I wouldn't change a thing about the career that I've led. I have had uh, wonderful opportunities. I have worked with fascinating people. Um, but I'll tell you, I think back to that, that night um, with my dad and trying to, to decide what it was I was going to do. And um, in many ways, I wished I had uh, pursued a business degree. I am a dropout from the, the the uh, University of Utah MBA program. I was in the executive program and less than halfway through when, when Scott Matheson did ask me to come serve as his press secretary and schedule wise I just couldn't make it work. But I love business and uh, I don't know how many of you are thinking about business careers, but you know, it's not 10 key adding machine and, and typing. Um, there are just, you know, there's opportunities opening every single minute. And I don't think there's ever been a time uh, in, in my life that I can remember when business has, has been as dynamic and exciting as it is today, that the possibilities are just huge. And you guys know better than I do. You, you look around at, at uh, the startups, a lot of them started right here in Utah. <clears throat> um, the, world, the world is an oyster and it, it's open to you. So. Um, in a way, I wished I'd done business. In another way, uh, I wished I'd gone on to, to law school. I love public policy. I don't know that I would have, I would have been a, uh, you know, a litigator. I think I would have, uh, would have pursued something in, um, in state or federal, federal government. So that's kind of a little bit about about me. Um, <clears throat> Whitney asked me to address uh, industry trends. I'm sure all of you. Uh, we're following the, the controversy over the past uh, couple years with net metering. Do, do you guys know what I mean when I say net metering? So people put solar panels on their roofs, uh, you're net metered to the utility, and we, we meter what you use compared to what you produce, and we net that out. That's where that comes from. And the way the rates had been set for, for many years is that Rocky Mountain Power would credit you for any excess power, power above what your consumption was, at the retail rate. And as, as the cost of solar panels have fallen, more and more people are, have installed them. And the issue has become one of equity with other customers. Uh, there's, 
kind of two things going on. One is that you're producing an electron. That's what we're, we're buying. But we can buy solar power today at about four cents per kilowatt hour from large solar farms. But net metered customers, residential customers, were being credited at about 10 cents a kilowatt hour. All of the rest of us who don't have solar panels, the, the cost then of the generation and the transmission and the distribution facilities that are built still to serve them, because at this latitude, uh, the capacity factor of solar is about 19, 20 percent. So 80 percent of the, the, in fact, it's actually more than that, but they are still using all of the infrastructure that we all share the cost of. So the, the um, Public Service Commission opened a hearing last, last August. There were a lot of, I sat there for hours and hours listening to people. But in the end, um, what happened was that the stakeholders, the, the solar contractors, advocacy groups, regulators, and Rocky Mountain Power worked for months. And we did put together what is known as a, a settlement agreement. Additional studies will be done. That net metering rate structure is going to, to change. People who have already installed them or who, who sign a contract by November 15th will uh, pretty much stay on the, on the old rate structure. But there will be um, a small reduction in that credit for the next um, three years. And then after that, based on studies, it will change. The reason I bring that up is just that this is probably the most cataclysmic ch uh, change that my industry has seen in 100 years. What is key to that would be battery storage. Mm -hmm. Because there's a basic mismatch between the, the time that the power uh, or the solar generation is peaking, which you would know is going to yeah. be on June 21st at about 1230 in the afternoon, and the time that customers reach their peak demand. So our system shows that our customers are using the most power <clears throat> sometime between 5 and 7 p.m. late in July, early August, whereas the peak solar production is coming on middle of the day in June. I was part of a study that we did on a substation circuit several years ago where we did some modeling with, with you know, LIDAR. You overfly an area and it yeah. you know, records the, the um, elevation of everything. So we, we were able to look at all of the available rooftops on this circuit, and there were like 326 of them. And then we're taking into account chimneys, dormers, buildings next door that would be shading. So we're modeling how many roofs you could put solar panels on and then how many solar panels you could put on. And then you run the, the models, and, and we did this great presentation that you could see, that running the sun 24-7, 365 days on these solar panels at this efficiency rating, <clears throat> how much power could be produced. And we look at the day that that circuit peaked. It peaked at August on August 2nd, for exactly 60 minutes between 7 and 8 p.m. At that time of day, on August 2nd, the solar panels would contribute 7% of what customers were using. So it's very clear that you still have to rely on the utility um, either to be exporting if you are producing excess, but 99% of the time you're importing. So that's what this whole whole issue is meant to settle. But uh, I, do, I don't foresee the day that um, there won't be an electric utility um, unless there is massive improvement in battery storage. And oh, yeah, if you know anything good. about batteries, they're pretty nasty environmentally yeah. as well. I, I don't disagree with anything you're saying. It's a, it's a matter of time. Yeah. Our, our industry is changing. Cool, huh? but, but what you're talking about will still cost money. 
And, and my point is we have to recognize that um, there is more to the, to the provision of energy and energy services than only producing that, uh, that electron. Yeah, and we have a legal obligation to serve. We are regulated by the Utah Public Service Commission. Um, every every uh, decision that we make about um, resources has to be approved by, by the Public Service Commission. Uh, if you look on your bill, you're going to see something for energy efficiency services. Uh, we pay customers. We've paid Salt Lake Community College. Uh, we'll give you cash to install more efficient technology. Um, lighting is easy. You know, we used to give you a lot of money to do LEDs, but the market for that has changed. We don't need to incent people. The prices have fallen. What we're focusing on is the heating, air conditioning, ventilation systems. We're targeting the, the, um, the wholesalers there so that they will stock it. If your air conditioner goes out, you're not going to wait a couple weeks to have a, have a more efficient model brought in. So we want the wholesalers to be stocking them, so we're giving them incentives to, to have the more efficient units. Uh, when new buildings are built, let's build in structural efficiency. We do an integrated resource plan that is dynamic. It's iterative. It's never finished. We're always looking ahead 20 years out to what we project our customers' needs will be and what is the least cost, least risk way of serving that, that load. And we, we project, the, the latest IRP, is that we will fulfill 89% of the growth, the new growth, with energy efficiency. Um, we, we've been able to hold demand pretty flat, which is a change from what it was 10 years ago when we were projecting we were going to have to build a new power plant every 10 years. That's not, you know, that's not going to happen. The, the changes that you're talking about you know, have, have manifest in a very short period of time. Um, I'm really proud to say that my company has been a leader in developing renewable energy. We are the second largest rate regulated utility owner of wind generation in the United States. And our sister company in the Midwest, Mid-American Mid Energy, is number one. Rocky Mountain Power is an operating division of Pacific Corp. And Pacific Corp, uh, about 11 years ago, was purchased by Berkshire Hathaway Energy which itself is a wholly owned subsidiary of Berkshire Hathaway, which is controlled, uh, majority controlled by Warren Buffett. And um, Berkshire Hathaway brought a, a business, I'm going to call it a business model or business principle, whatever you choose, that, um, that I suggest is a, is a very good way to operate a business, but it's also, I think, a good, a good way to consider uh, what we're doing in our personal lives, too. And that is to plan, to execute, measure, and correct. So we put a lot of effort. We're very risk averse as a utility. Um, the decisions that we make can affect all of our customers. You may not realize it, but we are you, you are us. And so we're looking at what your needs are, planning for those needs. When we make those decisions, then we have to look back and say, all right, was this the right decision? Did this accomplish what it was intended to do? So we're plan, execute, measure. And the next decision we might make, then we're gonna correct. If there was if there was anything that maybe we might have done differently, uh, it's it's like the IRP. It's always iterative. We're always looking to improve, to find better ways to meet our customers' needs. We've rolled out a lot of choices just in the past few years, recognizing that our customers um, want to have choices in their energy supply. We our Blue Sky Energy Program. Uh, we rolled out almost. You know, it's been 17 years ago that was a way for our customers on a voluntary basis to be able to support renewable energy development in the western United States. Uh, about a year and a half ago, we rolled out a program called Subscriber Solar, 
we built a 20 megawatt solar farm in, in Millard County. And if you want to cover 100% of your, your use with a solar farm in Utah, you can do that. Uh, if you're a high energy user, and we, we have three tiers in the summer, we want to send a price signal to our customers that the more you use, the more expensive it's going to get. We're trying to say, control your use, be more efficient. So if you buy subscriber solar, it is priced between the second and third tier. So we do have, we have customers who are very high energy users who are using the subscriber solar and actually paying less than they would have were they not using yeah, that program. And you can get online, if you've, if you've done that, you can get online and sign your own solar panels too. So um, where I, I am working with Salt Lake City who has set some goals to be net 50% renewable by 2020 in all of their municipal operations and for the community as a whole to be net 100% renewable by 2032. And you might be asking, what does that mean, net? Um, as I mentioned, you know, the sun's only out for so many hours a day. So unless you're all, unless we have enormous advancements in batteries, if you're going to want to be able to turn on the, the light first thing when you get up in the morning, uh, we're still going to have to have other resources. Our long range plan show we are accelerating depreciation on our coal plants and we'll retire those sooner than what their amortized life is. Uh, natural gas and wind will be the, the primary baseload resources that we have. Even wi wind is an intermittent resource. You have to have the gas to, to back it up. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a, a situation in Texas just a few years ago where that fast the wind quit blowing and 2,000 megawatts of power went offline. And that's when utilities activate their interruptible contracts. Uh, we have interruptible contracts with some of the very largest customers in the state. Kennecott is, is one of them. Uh, Nucor Steel is another. There have been instances where there are disturbances on the system that require activation of those, of those contracts. So um, we're, we're moving our generation portfolio towards cleaner resources and uh, working with Salt Lake City, with Park City, uh, and with Moab right now, I expect others to put them on a path to a more renewable future. But they understand not 100% of their generation is going to be supplied from renewable. It can't be. Yeah. It will be that at the end of the year, we sum what the, kilo, the number of kilowatt hours that were used across the customer base in that jurisdiction. And there will be renewable generation projects that over that period of time will have produce power equal to what the customers have, have used. Uh, it, is, it is an enormous project. We're, this morning I was just uh, working on an agreement that puts in place the framework now for Rocky Mountain Power to go out with a request for proposal to the market um, and start getting, getting bids on projects to reach Salt Lake City's 50% goal by 2020. Thanks. Okay, and and I, I want to be clear. I didn't work on their campaigns. I worked in their you offices. In their office, yeah, right. in their yeah. offices. And yeah. the way the connection was made with the governor was I was working in the state energy office at the time um, in the late in 1979, 1980, before you guys were born, and we were having this you know big energy. A crisis, the Iranian oil crisis was underway, the hostages in, in Iran, all that kind of stuff. And I was being asked by the governor's office because of my job in the energy office to write speeches for him. Uh -huh. And that was, was how that connection was made. And then of course, because of the involvement with the family, I became acquainted with Jim right. and he had, had just been elected and had asked me to, to come head up his office. But yeah, wh I am involved um, not in, not in the sense of, of getting involved in, in their races, but you all know, I mean, you read the paper. Um, 
if you're serving in public office and you're a mayor and you've got a city council, there's politics. And there's politics even among city council members themselves. And I have I've developed very, very good relationships with with all of the mayors, uh, the city council members at, in, in Salt Lake, I make it a point we we get together one on one uh, for lunch at least once a year, sometimes more often. But to connect about what are the issues, what can I help you with, you know, what are you hearing about us? Um, I consider that my background in the political arena has prepared me, has uniquely prepared me, in fact for the job that I do. There's no one in our, in our company working in this kind of role who, who brings that kind of experience to the job. And I, I wanted to, to say one more thing about uh, uh, giving, you, giving you a tip, and that is to network. Connect with people, um, engage with them, ask questions, figure out how, how you can help them there will be a day when you're going to need a favor, and don't you, don't you think that there's a whole lot of people who wish they'd been nicer to Oprah Winfrey in high school? Um, you know, networking and building relationships are so key uh, in the business world. It, it's, it's, you have to know it, but who you know can also op open the door to opportunities for you. Thank you. Thank you.